That City is sponsored and supported by attorneys Alan Feldman and Jeff Wirtz. The law firm of Feldman and Wirtz LLP is celebrating its 15th year as Aspen's preeminent boutique law firm, providing litigation and transactional legal representation to residents of the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond. Welcome to uh, Fat City. I'm your host, Hinton Harrison. First, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors, Feldman and Wirtz and Grassroot Community Network TV, which has been serving the community since 1970. And uh, I'd like to uh, point out that we are high up in the Rockies where the good vibrations go. And today I have two really special people with me that I'm really honored to present. Uh, one of them, of course, is the author of the first book, which was Thomas W. Benton, local artist, activist. And the most recent book, which has just been released, is Freak Power by Hunter S. Thompson's Campaign for Sheriff. And it's also, again, authored by Joseph Daniel Joseph Watkins and Bob Broaddus collaborated. So well, I'm going to ask these gentlemen some questions, and we're all curious to know how they got here and how, they, how Bob became sheriff, how Daniel became the author and publisher of this book, both of them brilliant uh, literary material. Uh, so first I'd like to start off with um, Bob Broaddus. Thank you for being here with us today, Bob. It's my pleasure, Hinton. It's an honor. And first, I, Bob, I'm, I'm sure everyone is as fascinated as I am about how did you, I, I would, the question would be, how and when did you get inspired to write, no, wait a minute, that's the wrong person. That's you. Okay. I want to, first I'll say, um, how did you get inspired to become the sheriff? To, to start that road, to come down that, that pathway to get to Aspen. Okay, uh, to be succinct, I got into law enforcement because of the climate. In 1976, the winter of 76, 77, Christmas in Aspen came and went without one flake of snow. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this town's economy is skier driven in the winter. The summers are a different story, but in the winter, if Aspen had no snow, Aspen had no commerce. This was before the Aspen Skiing Company installed snowmakers on the mountains. So Christmas, Aspen Mountain was brown, dead grass. All my friends were collecting unemployment. I had two little daughters. I was basically a single dad, and the unemployment benefits wouldn't cover their groceries, never mind the mortgage payment, etc. So I was going to teach skiing that winter. I needed to look for another source of income. The Aspen Police and the Pitkin County Sheriff both had help wanted ads in the Aspen Times, which was a mere weekly back then. So I applied for both jobs, and Sheriff Dick Keenest offered me a job before the city of Aspen police chief offered me a job. So in 1977, I became a rookie deputy. Okay, but you, where, did you, where are you from? I grew up in South Boston, Massachusetts. When you, like you went to, you went to college? I graduated from the University of Buffalo with a degree in history, and after a couple of years working for a multinational corporation in New York, I scooped my family up and we dropped out in Aspen, Colorado. How did you pick Aspen? I mean, did you look on a map and you... I had been here with my wife, the mother of my children, in the mid-60s on ski vacations, and always thought I'd like to live here for one reason, the powder, skiing. Right. And that's why I moved here. As I mentioned, we had one winter without any snow. That led to me being a cop 
and led to the ski company installing snowmaking equipment. But you, okay, one of the interesting things I read in the, in the little bio in your book is uh, you uh, were an anti-war activist, an anti-authoritarian, and mistrusted the government. What inspired you to pursue the law enforcement? Was that, was that kind of a... When I applied for the job and when I was interviewed by Sheriff Dick Keenest, he asked me, why do you want to be a deputy sheriff? And I said, I think I can do as good or better job at it as anybody. I think I understand both sides of the divide. You know, back, back then, it was a we, the the people who were opposed to certain governmental decisions, primarily the war in Vietnam, and other things that we as young people felt were violations of the trust between the citizen and the government, we decided that we wanted to, to become agents of change. And little did we know, as far as I'm concerned, my generation is most famous for helping to end a brutal illegal war. So take my anti-governmental opinions put them into becoming part of government, I thought that I could do a real good job as a representative of the people of Pickens County, a deputy sheriff. And I did that for about eight and a half years, took two years off to become a county commissioner, land use and zoning. <laughs> it put me to sleep. Right. And then in 1986, I ran for sheriff and was elected. And then I was reelected five more times until I retired about five years ago. How did you meet Hunter Thompson? I met him at the Jerome Bar in 1970 through a man named Michael Solheim, who was Hunter's campaign manager. And we uh, became friends then. We saw each other very occasionally until I became a deputy sheriff. Then I became a more important friend to Hunter. And then when I got elected sheriff, I became one of Hunter's most important friends. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, well, let's see here. DJ, why don't we bring you into this thing too real quickly. And um, when and uh, how did you get inspired to write about Thomas Benton, artist, activist, and journalist Hunter S. Thompson? But let's start with... Uh, uh, Benton, I mean, who is really an interesting person because Benton was one of the first people, I mean, he was at, when they were testing the nuclear bomb, he was protesting that. So that's the kind of person he was. So what, tell me, tell me. Yeah, so um, in college I was making my own anti-war artwork against the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. And <clears throat> just by chance on a family vacation, was here visiting, was at the Woody Creek art studio run by Larry and Jana Lefner, and I saw an anti-war print, <clears throat> the Korea, Vietnam, Iraq print, and uh, I saw it on the wall and just thought it was just unbelievably powerful and beautiful. So I asked the gallery owner, you know, who made that piece of art? And what's the story there? You know, and uh, he says, hey, that uh, was made by Tom Benton. His widow's outside, you know, it'd make her day if you told her that the poster was beautiful. And we got to talking, and she introduced me to George Stranahan, who said, hey, you know, I'm trying to catalog and find all these old anti-war posters. And we both agreed that you know, the message that Benton was putting forth back then was um, applicable today. You, know, you just change the dates. You know, it's the same message, the anti-war from the Vietnam had a new message here. So um, I was lucky enough to spend a few years working with George and a lot of other really cool people in the valley, including Bob, and um, cataloging about 500 works of art that went into the first book, um, which won the Colorado Book Award. But when I f kept finding uh, Benton posters, I kept finding stuff about Hunter's campaign. And, you know, a lot of rich material, but I wanted the first book to be just about Benton and his life and his work. But I kept filing away all the material from the sheriff's race. And Later on, I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting to do a book just about the sheriff's race because it encapsulated so much of the things um, that we hold dear in the Valley today. Um, you know, um, the way Aspen is, the environment, preserving the environment, limiting development, 
um, you know, the unique culture that we have here. So I just decided to put that book together, um, and it just came out. It's, uh, you can read more about it at freakpower.com. Good. And that's fascinating. And, and, Bob, and Bob wrote the foreword and the afterword, and, you know, Bob gave you the succinct version earlier, but there's some really great stuff in the book that he wrote. Um, you know, about his experiences and why he came to Aspen and, and then also the legacy of that campaign. And that's all in this book, and that's great, and if uh, people want to learn more details of it. But, okay, so now we've, we've speeded up here, and uh, you, how, did you get to meet Hunter? I didn't. You didn't? It came okay. a little late. You know? A little late. Okay. So then how did you and Bob come together on Freak Power? Well, we, we came together on DJ's Benton book. I was in my office one day, and my secretary said, hey, there's a guy named D.J. Watkins here. He's been trying to see you for weeks. You got 10 minutes? And I said, sure. So D.J. came in and said, hey, I got a problem uh, with a friend of yours. His name is Michael Cleverly. Michael Cleverly is an old friend of mine who's a great artist. Great artist. He lives in Hodgkiss now, but he used to live here. Um, Cleverly lived across the street from Hunter for 15 years in Woody Creek, and he was a very good friend of Tom Benton's. DJ had read a thousand-word piece that Cleverly had written about Tom Benton. DJ asked if he could use Cleverly's composition in his Benton book. C Cleverly said, for $10,000. <laughs> DJ said, I don't have that in the budget. Cleverly said, great, if you use one word of my composition, I'll kill you. DJ came to me to see if Cleverly was homicidal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I told uh, DJ he had threatened four other people with murder in the last month not to worry about it. Then we became really good friends. I was at the Explorer when he was given the Colorado Book Award for his Benton book. And then he went to Africa and while he was in Africa, in Kenya, on some luxurious island called Lamu, he did most of the work and the research on freak power. And when he got back from Africa, he asked me if I would write a foreword. We spent many a night throughout last winter in front of the fireplace doing the foreword. And then that led to stretching it out into an afterword that became a um, a compilation of things I learned as sheriff in Pitkin County for 24 years. Could you share a, a, a highlight of your learning experience in uh, Pitkin County? Something in... The job as a deputy sheriff, the first couple of years where you are a raw rookie, you learn more about yourself and your fellow man than virtually any occupation I can imagine. Mm. So I would say the first two years as a representative of the executive department of government, law enforcement, I learned a lot about me and a lot about you and everyone else. It's a great experience for a young man or a young woman in the Colorado Rockies. Well, then I got a good question for you, I think. Uh, can you describe what reforms and progress has been made in Pitkin County, and do you see an enlightened brand of law enforcement today as a result of your, you know, input in Aspen? Well, Hinton, now that you bring that up, DJ and I talked a lot about that exact phenomenon that Hunter Thompson's platform, which is incredibly detailed uh, in Freak Power by DJ, his platform, his philosophies, his policies were later, for the most part, all of them adopted by Dick Keenest, who was elected sheriff here in 1976. He's the guy that hired me in 77. Keenest took an awful lot of Hunter's law enforcement ideas and put them on the road. He instituted them. Had Hunter won in 1970, Dick Keenest was going to be his chief deputy, his undersheriff. So Dick Keenest took what Hunter had proposed during his campaign, implemented it, and then 10 years later handed that to me. And for 24 years, I adhered to most of those 
parameters. And then in, in uh, 2010, Joe DeSalvo, who worked for me for about 20 years, was elected sheriff, and he totally supports most of those programs that Hunter Thompson, Dick Keenis, Bob Broadus handed him. So I think there is a living form of Hunter's DNA in Joey DeSalvo, Pitkin County Sheriff, 2015, the present time. And, and I'll also add to that, one of the interesting things in the book is, is you know, Hunter's legacy from that came, campaign didn't only last through the Sheriff's Department. You know, a lot of the ideas he had about downsizing, you know, zoning, um, preserving the environment, um, creating uh, walkable pedestrian malls, um, you know, limiting cars coming into town. A lot of those ideas uh, resonated with later elected officials and people like Joe Edwards, Michael Kinsley. Um, people instituted a lot of those ideas. So it wasn't only law enforcement that this um, campaign had a la lasting legacy. It was other things that make Aspen the special place that it is today. Absolutely. So we come to the point where we are. So here we are in 2015, Hunter Thompson plant. We talked about Hunter Thompson's influence, and he has planted seeds in the 60s that now seem to be so timely. Is the utopian dream just a book called Freak Power by D.J. Watkins, or what is freak power? Well, you want to answer? Today. So, well, you know, one of the interesting things about the book, you know, you know Hunter was talking about the hippies being persecuted and protecting the hippies and you know in 1969, 1968 you know you could get arrested for blocking the sidewalk you could get arrested for playing the flute you know anything that hitchhiking they would put you in jail for 90 days so you know Hunter was sort of trying to protect the hippies and we were talking about this the other night there's a strange analogy um, you know Hunter was saying hey every race riot that starts is because of some trigger happy cop. Um, let's train the police officers to be peace officers. You know, let's even take the guns away from the police. So when you look at these ideas in the context of today with, you know, Eric Garner and Ferguson, Missouri, and all these other events where there's this sort of police brutality and these intense debates about law enforcement, it's really prescient to read what Hunter, um, you know, had to say about law enforcement and his ideas about making a more livable society and, you know, treating people with respect. Right. And, and there's the quote right there. You um, want to read it? Yeah. We cannot expect people to have respect for law and order until we teach respect to those we have entrusted to enforce those laws. And that's one of the opening quotes in the book. And that, I think, is, you know, sums up a lot because, um, you know, the legacy of Hunter's campaign, Dick Keenest and Bob and Joe, so they have a lot of respect for me, and they have a lot of respect from the community, um, and that's why, you know, they're successful. It it uh, it's amazing. I think it's incredible. You know, we talked about this a lot. I, I have the great opportunity to know Bob for many years, and uh, and I've met you, and I, I can't remember exactly how we met, but I, I'm glad we did, and we've been good friends ever since. And it always fascinates me how people come together, you know, and then things happen. You know, I mean, you look at when you have you have Hunter and you have the, uh, the, the beginning of Rolling Stone and you have Ralph Steadman. What a great combination. What a chemistry. The three of them and boom, all, they all become very famous. You know, Rolling Stone takes off. Now, um, it's, it's something's happening here today as far as I'm concerned. I really appreciate your presence here and that, uh, you know, I've been very appreciative of you know you supporting me yeah. as an artist and mm. I've you know taking photographs for you and telling mm. the story and you know and caption I always call myself a modern day scribe mm. you know capturing uh, and documenting life at, you know every moment of my life and you're part of it in this whole you know the Gonzo Gallery and uh, uh, you know promoting this book of free mm. power and it's been it's been fun yeah. yeah and that's that's one of the things that's been really cool about this is it's brought a lot of people together that really haven't been uh, co you know collaborating and we you know one of the cool things that happened with this is you know so many friends helped out bring the new gonzo gallery at 625 hymen to life you know everybody came out of the woodwork to help and you know i could never have done any of this without you know 
people like you guys helping me along the way. And Amazing. it's really been a special experience. You know, Joe Edwards, David Heiser's photography is in this book, Bob Krieger's photography, um, you know, countless Benton posters. Um, you know, the Historical Society helped a lot, the Aspen Times, Grassroots. You know, we've all sort of, uh, you know, brought a lot of people together. And that's been actually the, the, the real pleasure of this whole thing is the relationships and the, the people and the connections and... Um, community. And the community. It's, it's and that's what Grassroots is about. Right. It's about bringing, you know, the opportunity here. Um, so, it, it, it's, again... Um, what what we're trying to do, I mean, I, you know, Hunter's been totally misunderstood, I think, for so long, and unfortunately, it's, it's always been associated with his, you know, the drug uh, atmosphere. But we know that he 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 had a real um, literary uh, insights, and political insights, political, and he he really had his finger or his pulse on the, uh, and, and it's timely, and like you brought up Ferguson and other places that. You know where the law enforcement, and it hasn't changed, which is so bizarre. Mm -hmm. And you know, Aspen seems to be such an incredible place and environment to nurture free thinking, you know, and 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 more um, community, you know, diplomatic relationships, you know, with the community, with law enforcement, and things like that. Um, and I, 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 it's funny. I mean, this is not something that uh, you said, but I, I wanted to <laughs> ask you because. Um, Hunter had some pretty strong words about, you know, his objection to, to development, right? And, uh, and, of course, we see it, he wanted to stop the, you know, the runway extension. He really tried to be, uh, stop the um, development. And, of course, he referred to conservatives, those dirt pimps, greed heads, and land rapers seem to have accomplished their agenda here in Aspen. I mean, is that, how do you guys feel, what do you, how do you feel about that? What do you see? Oh, thanks, Hinton. I didn't know if I was going to get another word in. <laughs> Hunter, you got it. Hunter saw the um, threat of overdevelopment way before most people in my generation did. Even in the Rum Diary, which he wrote in the late 50s, he was referring to real estate developers as a, a blight that, quote, sped like his puddles on pavement in parking lots. He had his words, didn't he? Uh, that was a good metaphor for the late 50s, and Hunter would probably say the same thing today. But he saw the threats of overdevelopment, especially on the environment, water and air, but also the quality of life. Quality of life is a, a composition of many factors, but the whole movement that DJ alluded to before you went off on your solo riff there was Hunter ran for sheriff and a <laughs> bunch of courageous young people ran for county commission and for city council. And that's where the land use and zoning decisions are made. So Hunter was a catalyst for a stew of people who said, when do you know when you've gone too far? Usually when it's too late. Unfortunately, we're coming to a closure. They've given us a few minutes to bring, you know. Uh, I'd like to say something. So, so yeah, so, uh, share something. Yeah, here. so um, at the Gonzo Gallery, um, we're having a whole series of events um, called the Liberty Salons. Um, I'm not sure when this is airing, but we're having some events this weekend, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We're open noon to 10 every day. There's currently an exhibit of 100 original pieces of art and ephemera from Hunter's campaign in 1970 on display that complements the book. And um, we have the books available in the gallery as well as on freakpower.com. Cool. And again, you are located at 625 Hyman next to the Aspen Art Museum, correct? That's right. You have to stop by, come by, and you can hang out with um, DJ. And of course, Bob's always around. And I understand, I don't know when this is going to be aired either. So if we plug what's mm -hmm. coming up, Probably won't. Uh, and, and, I wanna, and I want to thank Hinton too, uh, the uh, world famous promoter of peace <laughs> and justice. He's a great man. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, guys. And also, we got to thank John Masters, uh, uh, you know, Grassroots, and, and Ryan, Ryan Allison. Ryan so Pansis is uh, over here behind the monitor broadcasting, and we got Patrick. Uh, uh, 
Bodalian, yeah. Patrick Bodalian behind the camera. And this is his first day, so he's doing a great job. If, if we're coming to an end, again, uh, welcome to Fat City. I'm Hinton Harrison, and I want to thank our sponsors one more time, Feldman and Wirtz and the Grassroots Community Network, and we are high up in the Rockies where the good vibrations go. Thank you, Bob Broaddus. You're welcome, Hinton. And thank you, Daniel yeah. Joseph Watkins, thank for you, blessing me with your presence. Uh, thank you, guys, very much. <laughs>